in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Well, it is time for us to fellowship in the word of God. And this is a day that we get to celebrate our great King Jesus Christ as we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. And I know you're excited about that. And it's the church role and responsibility to remind the world that Jesus Christ is no longer on the cross, but he, he was risen from the dead. And he said himself that all authority, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. And therefore go, go and begin to proclaim the message of the kingdom. Well, let us pray and go right into our lesson. Father, we thank you for this time that we have today to celebrate that awesome moment where you, God, manifested your grace to the world by allowing your son, Jesus Christ, to die for the sins of the world. Thank you for giving such a love sacrifice in our behalf, Father. Help us to make that known in the world, Father. Help us to be grateful and thankful for the salvation of the Lord through Jesus Christ. Bless our time together, Father, and let it be fruitful in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in our last lesson, we focused our teaching around Palm Sunday in Holy Week. And as I said, a lot of time people are doing things in the church and they really don't understand the significance. So we went through that particular period and we picked up the time during Holy Week whereby Jesus, uh, after carrying his cross for a time, he no longer could physically carry it. And then Simon was compelled by the authorities to take up Jesus' cross and carry it for him. And then there were the women who were mourning and Jesus gave them a prophetic word concerning the suffering that was going to occur in their future. And then there were two criminals on the cross, uh, one on his right and one on his left. One of them was concerned about his earthly uh, 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 life. The other one was concerned about his eternal life. And he declared himself that we are guilty and we deserve this punishment. But he has done nothing. He's innocent. And then he asked Jesus to allow him to enter into his kingdom. And Jesus assured him that he will experience eternity in heaven. I tell you what, God is a mighty God and he can do all things. There was lessons we gained out of that. The first one is this, that we got to cease the moment in responding to God's agenda. That's what Simon did. And then we said we've got to cease the moment to trust God at all times. Despite the suffering that may come in our life, we have to trust God at all times. And the last lesson is we got to cease the moment to make the change. Just like that gentleman that was on that cross knew he was wrong, knew he deserved that punishment, but he was willing to make the change and look unto Jesus. And that's what we've done in our life. We are not perfect, but we have looked unto Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ have cleansed us and washed us from the penalty of our sins. Well, today I want to talk about truth or traditions. You know, on our calendar, today is a day that we celebrate what we call a holy day. And there are days on our calendar that we set aside and we celebrate holy days. Every holiday is not a holy day. And what has to happen is the church has a responsibility. I call it a righteous responsibility in the earth to allow the light of truth to shine in a dark world. So often we want the world to change. God hadn't called us to change the world. He tells us not to be like the world. Don't pattern your life after the world. But we that are born again, we who claim the name of Jesus, we're different. Yes, the Bible even said in 1 Peter chapter 4 that those who live according to the world, they think strange of us. Why? Because we are different. We have a different standard. We have a different perspective. We look through a different lens on the outlook of life. We look through the lens of God's word. And so in that sense, we are different. But listen to some scriptures, 1 John 5, 19. John said, we know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Now notice the word sway. That means under the influence or control of the wicked one. Who's the wicked one? The devil. The scriptures reveal that Satan is the God of this world. And then in John 8, 12, 
Jesus said, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Notice, it's following Jesus. It's following the word that we're able to walk in light. Religion will not allow you to walk in light. But when we follow the scriptures, when we follow the gospels, when we follow the prophetic words that has been given in the Bible, the Bible says then we can walk in light even though we're in a dark world. And in Matthew 5, 16, Jesus said this, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. So yes, the world is in darkness. Jesus make that crystal clear in the scriptures. But the believers have the light of truth. And we have a responsibility to cause that light of truth to be present in a dark world. So here's the question that I want to provide answers to. How can believers allow their light to shine during holy celebrations in a world that is swayed, that is controlled and are influenced by the devil, the God of this world? I believe the first way we can do, do this is this. We have to magnify truth in the midst of traditional practices. Let me say that again. We have to magnify truth in the midst of traditional practices. So often Christians think that they are called to change the world. The Bible does not tell us to change the world. The Bible teaches us to not pattern our lives after the world. And when people pattern their lives after the world, that means that God is not the ruling authority in how they interact or react within the world. That's why we constantly have to come to church. It allows the light of truth to shine. And that truth keeps us on the course of the path that the Bible declares that shines brighter and brighter every day. That's why you need to come to church. If not, you can easily be swayed by the God of this world. Listen to 1 John 2.15. The Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. This is something Christians have to really take inventory of their heart. You know, the Bible says examine ourselves to see whether we're in the faith. We got to ask ourselves, do I love the world more than I love God? And then we got to begin to identify some things that perhaps we have put God on a lesser priority because we have a greater love for the things of the world. Listen to some more scriptures here. In John 3, 17, the Bible says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world should be saved through him. So often Christians, they want to fight against people that's non-Christians. They want non-Christians to live like Christians, and we got an issue with Christians living like Christians. Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world. He came into the world to bring light, to bring truth, so that people can have an option. They can decide whether or not I'm going to love the world or I'm going to love God. In 1 Peter 2.13, the scripture says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority. Listen, listen. When you and I have been given the authority earth, you know, in the earth over an entity, we get to decide the standards. We get to decide what those standards will be. But if we are not the person 
who has the authority of that entity, of that organization, of that system, the Bible teaches us to submit to that authority, in other words, so that God can be glorified. And then Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 9, 22 and 23. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that I may be all, by all means save some. I do not, I do all things for the sake of the gospel, so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. Notice Paul's attitude. Paul didn't go out to fight against the world. Paul didn't go out to condemn the world. Paul preached in such a way to embrace relationships. He went into different settings. When he was among the Jew, he became as a Jew. When he was among the Gentile, what he did? He adapted to their cultural practices. Not sinning, but recognizing that I can bring truth in the midst of their traditional practices. And believers can pray for God to give them wisdom so that they can bring truth in the midst of traditional practices. Remember I said we have to magnify truth in the midst of traditional practices. Listen, listen. All we have to do is magnify the truth. You don't have to go and protest and fight against the Easter bunny, the Easter egg. You don't have to do that. Why? That's what the world is going to do. That's what unbelievers they're going to do. But in the midst of that, we can magnify the truth. We can magnify terms and terminology that reflect the word of God. And the church now is at a point where the church is no longer magnifying even the word Easter. They are boldly declaring this is Resurrection Sunday. We're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. And then you may say, well, when it comes to the church, we have to recognize that Jesus has already established the authority over the church, so the church should never have an issue with reflecting the truth because the authority of the church is the word of God. And so if there's any traditional practices that is not in line with the word of God, we can immediately stop those practices because the church, I'm not talking about earthly businesses. I'm not talking about earthly entities. I'm not talking about worldly organizations. I'm not even talking about your neighbor across the street who want to put up a big bunny. I'm not talking about that. We don't even have to fight that kind of stuff. All we have to do is magnify truth. And when you have God's wisdom, God will give you the ability to exercise his wisdom and his love in such a way that you will be able to magnify truth. Listen to what the scripture says relative to the church. In Colossians 1.18, Jesus is the head of the body, the church. So that tells me right now, the authority of the church has already been established. We don't have to do those things. We don't have to endorse those things. We don't have to promote those things. We don't have to feel like we don't want to offend people. We got to tell them the truth. Why? Because the authority of the church is Jesus Christ. And when we celebrate the holy celebrations of the resurrection of Jesus, the church has a righteous responsibility. We don't have to fight against the Easter Bunny. We don't have to fight against things like that. All we got to do is magnify the truth in the midst of traditional practices. And in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Look at that authority that Jesus has given to the church. We are able to fight against and overcome the unseen, unclean spirits of darkness. The world can't do that. The world can't do that. Why? The world is under the sway of of the wicked one. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says the world is under the sway, under the influence, under the control of the wicked one. And you do not go into a spiritual battle thinking and operating in a natural way. 
The weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal fleshly of human origin, but they're mighty and they're powerful. Why? Because they're the weapons of God. It's the authority of heaven. And so we have to magnify truth in the midst of traditional practices. The other thing I believe we have to do if we're going to make sure that we cause our holy celebrations to cause the light of truth to shine in a world that is swayed by the wicked one is we have to minister truth in the midst of traditional practices. You know, one of the words that have been uh, shaped by tradition is the word minister. And you know, in traditional church, they, they want to know, uh, are you a minister? And then uh, once you uh, get a license, and then they say, well, you can do this. And then if you're going to do this, have you been ordained? And all kinds of stuff. You got to remember now, you got to realize we're all ministers of Christ. That means we're servants of the Lord. And see, we've exalted these terms in the body of Christ until we literally taken on the pattern of the world. Jesus, when he ministered to his disciples and to us, he took on the ministry of a towel by washing feet. And he said, this I've done for an example for you to follow. We took on the minister of titles, exalting ourselves, building hierarchies in the kingdom of God, and it's the same spirit of the world. I understand order. I understand authority. But when we begin to make these titles and things as if though they define us, and get this, you can be qualified by man but not qualified by God. Listen to what the scripture says in 2 Corinthians 3, 6. He has made us competent to be ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit produces life. What is Paul saying? He said that the Mosaic law was never intended to bring salvation. The Mosaic law was never intended to bring the light of truth that could cause people hard to be changed. But now that Jesus has brought us a new covenant, and now that we have the Holy Spirit, the Bible says we can have the life of God on the inside of us. And the Bible say he has made us competent. He has qualified us. I tell you what, when you get in the word of God and you begin to study the scriptures and God begin to anoint you, you don't need a license by man to go out and share the gospel. You just need to make sure that I am a minister of truth in the midst of traditional practices. Listen to 1 Peter 3.15. But in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Listen, listen. Paul is not saying anything about a license. He's saying something about a witness, a testimony. That you have the knowledge of God's word. So when anybody asks you anything concerning your faith in Christ, you can readily tell them what that truth looks like. And he said, when you do it, do it in humility. That's what gentleness and respect mean. And then over in 2 Timothy 2.15, the Bible says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A worker who does not need to be ashamed, who correctly handles the word of God. Saints, I'm telling you what, when you become committed, and you become diligent in your faith, and you start getting in the word of God, and you start getting under the teaching ministry of the body of Christ, and you start getting into the scriptures and learning the scriptures and rightly dividing that word, I tell you what, you're going to be able to minister truth in the midst of traditional practices. And sometimes, you know, I, I've seen preachers say, well, you know, it takes time. No, you just minister truth. You, minister, you don't go on to church and they ask you to be the pastor and you sit there and play patty cake with people. You know, that is trying to accommodate their flesh and trying to please them. And what's going to happen when you all of a sudden start teaching truth? They're going to get upset. Why don't you go in with the truth from the beginning 
and let that truth with be, and you know what it is? It takes faith to believe that the truth can bring transformation. It takes faith to believe that truth can change people's heart. And so we got to be willing to know that God's word is light and it's true in the midst of a dark world. And so when it comes to these holy celebrations, Christians, stop trying to fight against things that's being practiced in the world. Stop trying to, you know, go out and fight against all that kind of stuff. Well, he said, what are we going to do? Magnify truth in the midst of traditional practices. Minister truth in the midst of traditional practices. And the last one is this. Let us model truth in the midst of traditional practices. In 1 Corinthians 11, 1, the Bible tells us, follow my example just like I follow Christ. Paul didn't even say follow me. He said follow my example. My model that I'm putting in front of you is that I'm modeling Christ. And since I'm modeling Christ and you're going to model Christ, let us move in the direction whereby Jesus is our example. And in 1 Timothy 4 and 12, the scripture says, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech and conduct and love and faith and purity. Paul tells this young man, don't be uh, intimidated by anybody. You take time, you get in the word, you build up yourself with the knowledge of God's word, you live that word, you let your faith be a witness to others, you walk in purity, you live your life after Christ, you model Christ, let your conduct, let your behavior reflect Christ and operate in love. Let the love of God be seen in your life. And he told Timothy, if you're going to do this, notice, he didn't say you're going to be an example for unbelievers. He said you're going to be an example for believers. And too many Christians are going out, fighting unbelievers, speaking things against unbelievers because they are still practicing traditions that's contrary to the word of God. Stop it, Christians. Stop breaking relationships with people because they're doing something that you perhaps did yourself once and you're no longer doing it and realize where they are. They are under the sway of the God of this world. That's what the scripture says. The whole world lies in darkness. What's that? People who are not born again. People who don't know Christ, people who don't know the light of truth that Jesus Christ has brought into the world, but we who have that truth, we got to say, you know what? God didn't call me to change the world. God called me not to pattern my life after this world. God called me not to love this world. God calls me not to let the world have priority over the things of the kingdom. Jesus said, if any man put his hand to the plow and look back, he's not fit for the kingdom. And a lot of times, People claim they want to be with Jesus in heaven and not willing to live for Jesus while they're in the earth. we got to hear the truth. And the Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. Well, I want to encourage you today that this is a holy celebration for the church. We don't expect the world to honor God and magnify God. Why? Because Unbelievers are swayed by the wicked one. They're under his influence. Now I want to speak to the church. It's a poor witness. When the church began to accommodate traditional practice that is contrary to the word of God and know what the words say and know what we're celebrating. We are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, why don't we talk like it? Why don't we use the terminology that makes it clear that this is a day to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Why do we have to go to the world and get words and terms that the world has shaped through their God when we've got the word of truth? Let's magnify that. Let's put that on our signs in our communities. Come join us for Resurrection Sunday. What that does it make people think 
This is about Jesus. This is about Christ dying on the cross and being raised from the dead. The Bible say, it, Jesus said himself, no man takes my life, I lay it down. He said, I got authority to lay it down and I got authority to take it up. Boy, we got an awesome God. And so let's go and let's look for opportunities whereby we can magnify truth in the midst of traditional practice, where we can minister truth in the midst of traditional practices, and where we can model truth in the midst of traditional practices. Have a few faith uh, action questions. The first one is this. If you have not sought to magnify, minister, and model the light of truth during traditional practices concerning holy celebrations, what can you do to make the change? It's never too late to make the change. The change come when we hear the truth. Truth is what brings transformation. The word transformation means change. Romans 12, 1 and 2 say, I, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And verse 2, he said, and be not conformed, listen, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When you get the word of God in your heart and it's influencing your thought life, it's influencing your behavior. What's taking place? Transformation. The word of God brings transformation. Another question. How can you as a Christian parent incorporate the light of truth in raising your children in a world that is not God-centered? I want to say to parents today, you have to pray for the wisdom of God. You have to pray that God will give you the wisdom to be able to know how to maneuver with your children in a world that is not God-centered. And you gotta know that that world is not God-centered. You gotta know that that, that public school system is not God-centered. And so you won't be in there thinking you are gonna change something. You gotta recognize that I've got to know how to magnify truth in the midst of these traditional practices. I got to know how to minister truth in the midst of these traditional practices. I got to model truth in the midst of these traditions. And I got to train my children so they can know the truth. Yes, they go to school and they're going to see all of those different things that has nothing to do with the resurrection of Jesus. And that's okay. But when they get home, somebody is going to sit down and teach them the truth. So they're going to know that we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. My school may not be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. My school may not even say anything about Jesus. But in my home and in my church, they both agree that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and we are celebrating his resurrection. The last question, in Jesus' commitment to love humanity, yet not be as the world, how can this help you follow his example? Jesus did not come and say, I hate the world. I hate the world. Matter of fact, John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The next verse 17 says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world may be saved. So what are we talking about? We're talking about human beings. God loves humanity. And so when we begin to go out and magnify truth, minister truth, model truth, we got to be motivated by a love for souls, a love to see them come into the family of God, a love to see them snatched out of that kingdom of darkness and translated into the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And only God can do that. Only God can save. Only God can forgive sins. And so we are called to magnify truth to minister truth, and to model truth in the midst of traditional practices. Well, I know you've been enriched through the word of God that is spiritually empowered to live for God and to bring glory to his name. Thank you for coming together around the table of truth and, and receiving the word of God. Not just hearing it, but receiving that word. Not as a word from man, 
but as a word from God because it is the word of the living God. I want to thank you for your faithfulness and steadfastness. Word of Life Church, you know who you are. We appreciate your commitment to God first and your commitment to the things of God. And we are working together. We're co laborers with Christ to carry out his work. God bless you and have a great day in Jesus' name.